One of the most common examples that evolutionists like to use for proof of evolution is the horse. They present fossil after fossil, but they conveniently leave out that this sequence of fossils was disproven in the 1950s by the evolutionary scientists themselves. As Dr. Ken Hoven points out, They arranged a bunch of animals in a fictitious order. It's been proven wrong 50 years ago. But back in 1950, G.G. Simpson, who believed in evolution, said this evolution of the horse family was unintentionally falsified. The evolution of the horse was all wrong. Over 50 years ago it's proven wrong. It never happened in nature. Why do they keep putting it in the books? They say this example of the horse evolution has not held up under close examination. Othniel Marsh made up this whole idea in 1874. He wanted to provide evidence for Darwin's theory. He picked animals from all over the world and put them in order he thought they would look good. It's imagination. Modern horses have been found in the same layers and lower than the so-called ancient horse. The ancient horse is not a horse at all. It's a hyracotherum. It's like the hyrax, still alive in Turkey and East Africa today. The ribs, toes, and teeth are different on these animals. In South America, the fossils go backwards, the wrong way. They don't talk about that. They're never found in the order presented. The whole thing is imagination. If the scientists themselves know it's a lie, why should the rest of us believe it? I had to investigate. Today, there is an embarrassment of riches showing every intermediate step in the horse development from their three- and four-toed ungulate ancestors. We also have so many sister species that it is often difficult, if not impossible, to determine which clade is ancestral to which. For example, Equus simplicidensis, also known as a Hagerman horse, an extinct species which is nearly indistinguishable from modern horses. It is represented by over three tons of fossils discovered in Hagerman, Idaho. Among the remains discovered were over 100 skulls, five complete skeletons, and several other bones. This species is found in deposits going back 3.5 million years where they transition and become nearly indistinguishable from Dinohippus. This species was originally thought to have a single hoof, but in 1981, Mike Voorhees, curator of vertebrate paleontology at the University of Nebraska State Museum, discovered specimens with two additional miniature toes in the ashfall of the Mount St. Helens eruption. Dinohippus is found in strata going back 10 million years, where it also becomes nearly indistinguishable from Pliohippus, which is found in strata going back 15 million years, where it too becomes nearly indistinguishable from the continuously transitional Hipparion, Parahippus, and Merichippus, which are noted for their two pronounced but relatively small toes on either side of their back hooves. These species are simply the three most likely ancestors of Dinohippus. There are several other likely candidates found in strata up to 34 million years where they all transition quite smoothly into Myohippus and Mesohippus, two genera of equids distinguished by their fully three-toed feet. Their descendants were so successful that they lived alongside their one-toed relatives for millions of years after their lineages split. As we reach deeper and deeper strata, we see continued examples of small changes in equid fossils through Epihippus and Orohippus to Hyracotherium, so named because of its resemblance to the modern Hyrax, especially the presence of a fourth toe in some specimens. Although Hyracotherium and Hyrax do share some similar looking traits, there are notable differences in the construction of the nasal cavity as well as the dentition. While the Hyrax still retains rodent-like incisors and molars, Hyracotherium possesses more differentiated molars and incisors similar to those of the modern horse. In fact, going forward in time through the specimens we've discussed, we see the dentition slowly adapt to a jaw better suited to eating harsh grasses. Additionally, we can also see the gradual elongation of the equine tarsal bones, which gives horses more spring in their step. The entire way, however, we can never be sure which species are direct ancestors of the horse or simply a sister clade. The equine family tree even has some giant lineages, showing completely different adaptations to different ecological niches like the Indricotherium. 
When Darwin and Wallace first proposed the idea of evolution via natural selection, it was met with intense skepticism by the scientific community, which had, up to that point, embraced the more individually directed form of evolution proposed by Lamarck. By the time Othniel Marsh had pieced together a potential fossil lineage for horse evolution in 1874, the Darwinian synthesis had gained acceptance, but there was still the assumption that change over time was a steady, gradual progression toward more and more fit individuals. This view was dubbed ortho Genesis by the biologist William Heck in 1893. At the time, there were enough specimens to assemble a chronological lineage for many species, but by the 1950s, there were so many known specimens of fossil horses, among other groups, that there was virtually no way to tell which particular species were most likely to have given rise to modern horses. The smooth, gradual model of orthogenesis just didn't fit. And this is what scientists were discussing in each of Hoven's quotes. George Gaylord Simpson couldn't have been more clear when he stated that the evolution of the horse is not orthogenic, and that the common model at that time never happened in nature. That's also what C.C. Starr, Ralph Taggart, Christine Evers, and Lisa Starr were referring to in Biology, The Unity and Diversity of Life, Chapter 18, Organizing Information About Species, which Hoven wrongly attributed to their publisher, Wadsworth. The quote, other examples, including the much-repeated gradual evolution of the modern horse, have not held up under close examination, was the preamble to an explanation of the then-recently fleshed-out theory of punctuated equilibrium. This is also why Professor Thomas Stanley Westall, Durham University geologist, told the British Association for the Advancement of Science at Edinburgh, the ancestral family tree of the horse is not what scientists have thought it to be. The early classical evolutionary tree of the horse, beginning in the small dog-sized Eohippus and tracing directly to our present day Equinus was all wrong, meaning it was anything but orthogenic. And although Moskovskaya Pravda is a Russian supermarket tabloid, Krutzhilin and Ovcharov were discussing this same overabundance of fossils when they noted that modern-looking horses are often found in strata with their three-toed sister clades. So while orthogenesis was soundly disregarded, this overabundance of fossils is exactly what Darwin had predicted in Origin of Species. However, the theory of common descent regarding horses was fully vindicated when, in 2013, a team led by Ludovic Orlando from the Center for Geogenetics at the University of Copenhagen in Denmark compared the genomes of five modern horses, a donkey, and the recently sequenced genomes of a 43,000-year-old Pleistocene fossil horse, as well as a 560 to 780,000-year-old fossil horse. Publishing in Nature, their measurements of mutation rates in all seven samples showed a common ancestor roughly 4.5 million years ago. In the past decade, I have seen creationists begin begin to accept the evolution of the horse as the adaptation of one biblical kind. As you can see, with the exception of the size and shape of a few body parts and the reduction of a few digits, the overall body shape of the modern horse is not dramatically different from its three-toed ancestors. So one might say that the creationist view on horse transitionals is evolving. In this investigation, I discovered how blatantly creationists will quote a scientist out of context to make it look as if they're saying something that they're not. In this case, capitalizing on the 1950s refutations of orthogenesis and implying that they referred to evolution in general. The mere fact that we have far too many species of ancient horse to know which lineage they followed is just one major reason why orthogenesis was rendered obsolete. And it's another example of how creationism taught me real science. If there's a creationist argument you think I should investigate, please comment below. It may become the basis for a future episode. In the meantime, subscribe and make sure you don't miss it.